Hey, Morris, it's Olga, just making sure that you can hear me. I can hear you, Olga. Can you hear me? I can hear you perfectly, and I can see you perfectly. I am going to leave the this piece of it just so that your screen can be larger, and then I'll come back in as soon as I see any questions come through. Okay. okay. Thanks. Thanks. All right, actually, let's test this. Olga, can you also see my presentation? Yes, I can. Right. I would just put it in PowerPoint mode. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. All right, thanks. I have to come back in. <laughs> no problem. Thank you. Hi, Morris. Um, it's 1021. I would go ahead and get started. All right. Thank you, Olga. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, today, we're going to talk about basketball and more complex uh, for a gentleman who's like next to the way to the Cardiway product. Uh, we're going to be a Cardiway team. We're going to talk today about basketball. Talk about the inherent, what is that fairly inherent advantages? Hey, Morris, you sound a little um, muffled. Mm -hmm. All right. Sorry. Uh, now sure. you sound. That's better? Okay. Yep. Thanks, Olga. Nope. All right. So, uh, so let's start again. We, we're talking about uh, GraphQL. The advantages of GraphQL, and the, what are the inherent challenges that come up from those advantages, and how can we overcome those? those challenges while maintaining the advantages of GraphQL. Uh, I know some of the people here might be, uh, have used GraphQL a lot and some people knew, hopefully, hopefully this will be okay for all of you. And, and uh, I think we'll, we'll go through this through the lens of a, a fictitious uh, uh, company as they go through their journey of figuring out whether they should use GraphQL and, and, uh, and how, how it'll be for them. 
Uh, so I called this fictional company the best bank. We're at a banking conference here. Uh, so talk about some uh, some typical bank as we go through their history, going from the left to the right, uh, everything above the arrow would be the changes in the industry that are that are happening around that affect then what TBB does to respond. Uh, and then what TBB does in response to these technological changes would be below the line. All right, so let's assume that they formed in in, in 1950. And, and as I go through this, um, it's really taken from a bunch of different sources, different companies. I put one link at the bottom. You can get when you get the slides after the conference is a, a Facebook account. But there, are, if you search the web, there are a bunch of different engineers' blogs working at different companies around five years ago, uh, who all talk about the same kind of journey of of why they're getting to GraphQL or, or other technologies that are very similar. All right, so uh, so so older technologies. You know, when the PC came out, obviously TBB had to respond, putting the uh, com computers in their branches. When the uh, when the web came out, eventually they they caught up in 1997 with their first web banking application, which is then a uh, something that somebody can use on the web. They don't have to go into the branch to do banking; they can bank at home. Uh, when it starts getting closer to what what we're talking about today at, a, at an API conference, is when uh, Microsoft in 1999 came out with XML HTTP request. This is a uh, what later became known as AJAX. Uh, but back then, it was still starting as uh, not what anybody called web APIs, but as the, the prototype of what we're calling APIs today. Or if you think about it, you start with dynamic HTML uh, to, to move around on the, uh, the user interacting with the screen, maybe clicking a button, and that button click resulting in an XML HTTP request, which is making an HTTP request to a backend server. Call that you know, backend endpoint. When the backend endpoint's responding with some XML data that's then displayed to the user, All right? And as soon as as this happens, then you know, obviously, a few years later, TVB responds with the Web 2.0 app where they're making use of these uh, X, these kind of HTTP, uh, HTTP endpoints. Uh, and as time goes on, they they start with you know one endpoint per web page that they want to display. Eventually, there start to become times when they want something new in their web app. Right, and they 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 want their website to be able to show a new screen, uh, where all the data is kind of already there, but not packaged the way they want. Right, so let's say they've got endpoint one and endpoint two, and now they want to serve some data that half of it's in endpoint one, half of the data comes from endpoint two. So they're given a choice: either they can reuse those two endpoints. Now, what does that involve? That involves making two round trip requests, right, instead of just one. It involves overfetching data. Because they're going to, uh, because they're going to get all the data from endpoint one, all the data from endpoint two, even though they only need half of it, uh, and you know, so so it's not ideal, but it's not really so bad, right? It's only two bound trips, but the internet's pretty fast anyway. It's only uh, it's fetching some extra data, but the data is probably all zipped up regardless, so it's not it's not actually that much more data to transfer. On the other hand, their other alternative is to make a new endpoint three. The downsides there are first of all that besides just a new Client app, they also a new part of the client. They also need a new part of the server, right, and to implement a new endpoint. And then also, they now need to support three endpoints going on instead of just two, uh, which could be arbitrarily long into the future. So you know, sometimes when this decision point came up, TBB chose to to reuse. Sometimes they chose to make new endpoints. Sometimes they chose kind of hybrid approach. Um, and it, you know, it wasn't so bad. Uh, and and they continue. 2007, the iPhone comes out, and after it, obviously, a whole stream of different smart devices, uh, phones and, and, and uh, tablets and things like that. And each of them brings a new, a new environment that you want to run in. So, so the, the first attempt from TVB, like everybody else, was to just let customers keep using a web browser and using the app over a web browser. The second attempt when that wasn't good enough and everybody else is doing native apps, they have to do native apps, was to let their native app just kind of wrap a web browser. Uh, and then there are many well-documented ways from several companies of why that didn't work, right? The longer term, the browser wasn't wasn't improving performance as fast as uh, as native apps. The the uh, the browser can't get as quick access to, uh, to various user inputs as native apps can, et cetera, right? And so they, they really needed to make a real native app uh, once they design a native app, then obviously they're making endpoints that target it, right? Uh, and you can imagine you have every different tablet these starts to have 
or in phone starts to have different real screen, real, uh, screen real estate sizes. So you want different amounts of data to come back from the endpoint. Uh, you've got different amounts of connectivity uh, and from, from different places. So it just starts to become a whole bunch of, of different things you want in these endpoints, uh, somewhat different from each other. So this decision of making new endpoints you're using comes, starts coming up a lot more. The next major innovation is Swagger coming in 2011. Uh, and, and TBB, in fact, in 2013, starts to use this to not only provide endpoints to their own internal client app, but also to start to provide endpoints that serve third-party uh, business partners, the bank's business partners. Uh, and then as time goes on, there's become more and more uh, of, these, of these endpoints that they're supporting, hundreds, and eventually by, by today, they've got thousands of different HTTP endpoints to serve many different kinds of permutations here. Uh, so this has become totally untenable for the bank. They they've got um, they've got maybe hundreds of engineers they've hired at this point to develop all these endpoints and maintain them over time, uh, or dozens at least of engineers. So so at this point they just decide there has to be a better way, right? Uh, they want something some situation where they could somehow have one API that they support on the server uh, that yet can support all their myriad of client and business partner needs where every client gets data that's optimized to them, and yet they're not wasting with more and more implementations on the server all the time. Uh, just, just one, you know, no, no, no back end for front end, right? And so, so they hear that GraphQL kind of helps in this, uh, in the space that TBB has gotten themselves into, and, uh, and they start investigating. The first thing that TBB discovers about GraphQL is that the main principle of GraphQL is the client is in control, all right? Uh, and we'll get a little more into details of what that means. They see that uh, the, the provider in a GraphQL scenario, the server, the provider, can define their data at design time. So in this case, a uh, small little example, they say you can query for me. Me means the logged in user. Somebody is passing their maybe OAuth bearer token or however they authenticate themselves and then retrieving the user record. And then maybe you can ask that user for his name or age, get information about, about that user. Here's an, the client sends the query at runtime, simple little query, say me. And I don't have to ask, even though age is available, I don't have to ask for it. So I can only ask for the name. And let's say the logged in user is Alice, then she'll get back that her name is Alice. And notice that the response comes back looking a lot like the query, right? Me corresponds to me, name corresponds to name. So I'd say it, it looks uh, very predictable responses. Uh, as TBB starts getting a little deeper, they see that you can nest queries in, in GraphQL. Uh, and when you nest them, it's kind of a, a natural nesting syntax. There's no explicit join or, or anything like that other, that other languages would have. Uh, you can, you know, uh, different people feel different ways about this. But if you just take a look at the, the left hand uh, of the screen here, we see that I, ask, I query for me, my logged in user, and maybe I want my name and my age. And I also ask my, my friends. Now, friends is going to be some kind of join in the, uh, the backend database. And then for every friend, I don't actually need the age of the friends, just their names is enough. Uh, what happens when I run this? All right, so important principle in GraphQL, every field, there are types and fields, every field in GraphQL corresponds to a function that's running in the, in the GraphQL middleware. So that means that here when I run the me, I need to, to populate the me field, that means I'm running a me function, right? And this function uh, on the server is going to authenticate the user from the bearer token or something to authorize them, see, uh, see uh, what, where they are in the, in the database, the user table in the database, get back that user object. And then that user object, the reference to the database is gonna be in my context in which I evaluate the next field. So then when I evaluate name, it's pretty easy to just take the name out of the user, same with age. When I get to friends, it's a little more interesting, right? This is where I'm doing the, uh, the, the join, which from a GraphQL perspective is implicit to the client. Um, so friends is probably going to look up, and I'm going to get an, uh, an array of IDs. And each of the IDs, I will look up in the, you know, again, as a, in the, the user table. And so I'm going to have now an array of user objects. And with each user object, I'm going to then evaluate everything that is inside the friends in the query, which is, in this case, is name. So I just get the name for each one of those. Right? And if you see Alice's three friends. All right, at this point, TVB is, uh, is happy. Looks like it's pretty simple. Looks like it could satisfy their needs. So their next question is, if they went with GraphQL, would they have to throw away decades of work on the back end that they've got in their database? Uh, they're very happy to 
find out that GraphQL actually is middleware, as I referred to. Not it, it doesn't replace your backend. It's a middleware that sits in front of your backend. So what this means for TVB is that they've spent maybe 30 years, 50 years on database optimization. Right? They, they've got all kinds of stored procedures. They've done uh, hired people to optimize their schema. And they've done all kinds of different uh, database optimizations. And none of that's lost. The database stays intact the way it is. The difference is just that they need to add in these resolver functions so that for every field, they just have to say how it gets its data from the backend database, put that in the middleware, and then and the rest is taken care of for them. Um, now, while they want to keep their all the work that they've done, they've done all these decades of work, uh, TVB also feels that they kind of want to start modernizing. GraphQL is one part of that, but they want to, would rather be able to bring in other data. So this, they're also happy about finding that, uh, as you see in the picture in the bottom right, that the GraphQL server can can expose as a single graph data that's coming from various different places in the back end, right? Did different databases, maybe some RESTful API calls, some legacy data stores, things like that. Uh, the other thing they, they find is that they're, when you're at, at runtime, runtime in production, when you're sending requests, obviously you don't need a UI to do that. But to develop against GraphQL, there's a very convenient UI. Here's at the bottom left, a uh, open source UI called Graphical, Graph IQL. Uh, this one is open source, uh, as is the uh, some, some uh, GraphQL runtimes. Uh, and many people have taken it and skinned it and added features and made different versions of it, forked it, and things like that. But the uh, many, many people use just this basic UI as it is. The way it works is when it first starts up, it connects to your backend server. Uh, and you can imagine GraphQL already has, what's the one thing it knows how to do is it knows how to do fine-grained, very flexible, uh, queries over your backend data, right? Uh, and so it reuses this to do flexible, very fine-grained queries uh, over the metadata, over your types and fields to say what's available. So when the UI starts up, it asks the, the backend what's called introspection. It says, you know, what are all your types and fields and stuff that I can do with you? And gets the answer back. Once it has the answer, this this UI is able to show um, up to up to date documentation that's in sync with the server. Uh, what the types of fields are and what is what's documentation on them. It's also able to to help you with type ahead and autocomplete to help you write your query in the left hand side, uh, and uh, and be able to do local validation to tell you without even sending the request whether it's valid so that you fix all your problems before you ever send it. Uh, and once you want to see what it what it actually what data it actually gets back, you can send that request to the backend server where it's executed, comes back with the response, and displays it to you in the UI. All right. So again, looking good so far, looking like they wouldn't have to replace what they have, but they'd be able to add this layer that, that makes uh, some of the stuff easier for them. The best bank's next question is, are they the only ones who are interested in GraphQL? Is, this, is it kind of popular? You know, they, they don't want to be the only ones using some new technology. Uh, the answer is GraphQL is actually quite popular. It is pretty new, uh, but it's already got open source implementations in every language that TVB is interested in. Uh, the reference implementation in JavaScript is available over NPM. It's currently getting over 4.5 million downloads every week, right? putting it as one of the most popular repos on all of NPM. Uh, and the uh, uh, and we're doubling year over year. Um, and so it's, it's increasing much faster than standard popular things like, uh, like Lodash. Uh, they see that not only is it available with open source implementations in many languages, but there are thousands of stars on many of them both older languages uh, as well as newer languages. Uh, and finally, many big companies are already using it. Uh, so uh, there's a subset there. So they're pretty happy. They decided that their, their high level search is OK. Now they want to get slightly more into detail. So we already talked that the main principle is that the client is in control. Uh, and so they delve, TBB delves one level deeper. What are the high level subsets of this principle? How does it manifest itself with GraphQL? And one is that the client knows all the details of the server. It knows what's available. We already saw a little bit. We'll look slightly more detail. And the other one is that once you develop your query and you're running it in production, when you're sending transactions, the client controls the contract of every request response. So if you're used to WSDL and SOAP or open API swagger uh, kind of stuff, this is a little weird because you, you kind of expect that the server says what the contract is at an endpoint and the client uses it. But uh, if you're used to GraphQL, then that's not, it's, you, you've come to expect this. This is normal. Uh, and it's hard to 
to really understand what it means without examples. So we'll go, we'll go into that a little later. But first, let's talk about the, the first high-level principle. The client knows the details of the server, right? So we've seen this picture of graphical, this UI a few slides ago. Uh, but as, as TBB starts experimenting, here's an example of TBB's uh, an, a use of the actual TBB schema, back, TBB GraphQL backend that they're experimenting with. So the right-hand side, we see the up-to-the-date documentation, right? It's pulled from the server. So as soon as a new field or a new type is added on the server, it's immediately available to all clients with this in sync uh, documentation and type system. Uh, on the left-hand side, left-hand pane, we see that now with that documentation, I can hover over like joint owner and it gives me the documentation on it. It also gives me type ahead uh, so that it will it'll do autocomplete of my of what I'm typing and help me fill in what I'm doing and tell me what subfields are needed and all that kind of stuff and tell me what their types are. Uh, it'll be able to also then do local validations, make sure it's all, all accurate before I even send it to the server. And then once I actually send it to the server, you see in the middle pane, I get back predictable responses, right? So uh, you see on the left-hand side, I ask for edges, which has node, knit, date, and amount. And the right-hand side, I get back edges, which is an array in JSON of nodes, dates, and amounts, right? So it's uh, it's very predictable. Now, this is beautiful. It seems like a great client experience. But uh, given that uh, you all know about banks as well, uh, I imagine most people watching right now are thinking, uh, that's great, but it's also dangerous, right? So it, it, in fact, you know, is dangerous that you're the provider is opening themselves up that whatever they expose on the back end is suddenly visible immediately to all clients, right? Great for client productivity. Uh, uh, and uh, and for documentation, but there's risks, right? Consider this example subset of TBB schema. They say that they have uh, every customer has a credit card, uh, and the credit card has its number and its PIN and things like that. Uh, is that good data to expose? Well, of course it's good data to expose, right? The the billing partner wants if you order something wants to be able to come in, look at the credit card number, and charge it. So he needs to be able to get the credit card number. He needs to be able to get the PIN and the expiration date. Um, and it's good that he has access to all that data. But there are some people who should not have access to it, right? Even if the order analytics team is internal to DBB, the order analytics team has no business looking at the credit card data. They just want to know what you ordered uh, and what your name is and stuff like that. Maybe the city you live in, they don't need to know uh, your credit card number. All right, so how can we deal with this? Uh, one way is that when we get the actual request for credit cards, we talked about that, that field credit card that returns the type credit card, that field corresponds to a function running in the GraphQL middleware. So that function can do your authentication, authorization, to see if you have rights to credit cards. And if you don't, reject the transaction at that point. And this exactly one-to-one -one corresponds to what we did in the REST world, where that was a REST call, and we did authentication, authorization, and rejected the transaction if you weren't one of the people who can who, who can access it. So um, so, th so it's, it's, you know, that's, uh, Seems pretty simple, straightforward. Another thing we could do is we could try to be a little a little broader in our scope and actually make sure that we somehow hide this credit card information from the schema so that anybody, including introspection, that looks for it doesn't see it. So that it's it doesn't just fail the transaction, but it's actually a little stronger, an invalid field and not even a field at all. Um, obviously, that's much more difficult. You have to get into a number of different places in the GraphQL engine. Uh, so we kind of rather do the the earlier the checking access rates, but it really is dangerous. It leaks information. So um, you know the the somebody like the analytics guy knows that credit cards exist even though he can't access them. And the other problem is that as soon as you open something on the back end, before you even have a chance to decide whether it should be exposed, it's automatically exposed everywhere. Right. So so our recommendation in IBM, we think we really should be doing the more extensive change, uh, and we can talk a little bit more about how to do that. But basically. Uh, it should be a little more like in the REST world where I didn't even expose that endpoint to customers who shouldn't be having it. Here, I shouldn't even be exposing that part of the GraphQL schema to customers who shouldn't be having it. All right, so that that is talking about what the clients can see as available. We said the other high-level principle is that the client is in control of the contract. All right, so before we, we get into that, let's talk as a background about just what the topology looks like. Uh, I imagine all of you have some topology like this. The, the uh, at the left-hand side, you've got a client. The right-hand side, you've got some REST server, uh, which has access to various databases, uh, third-party REST calls, legacy data, something at the, at the right. In the middle, you stick some form of API management, uh, at least at a bigger company. 
Uh, and then at a bigger company, not only do they have some form of API management in the middle, but they've got a, a development team that, that works it, that's in charge of governance uh, for, for the entire system. And so when somebody on the backend team, right, the backend will have a number of development teams, every application, there's some application team uh, for one application, a second, a third, different application teams around it. At bigger customers, it's often dozens of application teams. And when they want to expose something else, they go to the team for the management layer and say they want to expose new endpoint to certain customers. They want to give it certain rate limits for certain customers, things like that. Uh, and the system all works pretty well. Well, what happens when TBB wants to, they're thinking now of taking that, see the picture of the REST server on the, on the slide, and they want to take out the REST server and replace it with a GraphQL server. Now, when they, when they do this, I mean, we already talked about that the clients can now instantly see every change from the back end, which makes governance hard. But the other issue is that, um, like, how do you do rate limiting? How do I, how do I control? Because every transaction that comes through goes to a single endpoint, right? With GraphQL, we said we have all these different types and, and fields, but instead of having hundreds of endpoints, that's a big advantage, right? Is that we only have one endpoint that has these different things which you can combine in arbitrarily flexible ways so that I don't need new endpoints. I don't need any changes on the server when a client wants to package it in a different way. That's a big advantage of GraphQL, but, but the challenge here is that a single transaction might be using only innocuous things on the back end. It might be using really expensive things on the back end. It might be using few things or many things. Um, and so I can't just rate limit them to three per minute or 100 per minute anymore, right? I now have to start, you know, want to control them in some way that's really specific to knowing what's in that payload, what's in that GraphQL query. So th there's only, as far as I know, one real solution to this at a high level, which is to add GraphQL intelligence to your management layer, right? So that it can do GraphQL aware um, management of this transaction. That, so, and, and you know, we've done that at IBM, but also other companies, everybody's providing management one by one, all the management companies are, are providing GraphQL intelligent management in there. Um, and so, and you know, how, how it works, the details of how you actually do GraphQL aware management uh, are obviously then gonna be very important. Uh, let's talk about just like a, a more specific example here at the top left of this slide. You see a, a GraphQL query. It's got the uh, users. It says I want to fetch all the users in my backend database, but not quite all of them, limit of 1,000, because you know, maybe there are 50,000 users. I only want 1,000 at a time. Don't want it to get too out of hand. All right. For each user, I want to fetch the orders. Uh, but again, not all of them, let's say just the first 1,000. Uh, and so it's obviously at this point, it might be getting up to a million orders coming back if there, if there are so many. Uh, and then for each one of those, I want payment details. Uh, payment details uh, assume that this is going to a backend server, so to a third party server. So the TBB wants to get like the payment details of is, has the credit card been auth uh, authorization gone through yet or something. They need to ask the credit card company and they've got a, uh, a REST call they can make to a third party uh, credit card service to find out the payment status. And this means that this one query, this one transaction might be making up to a million calls to a third party service. Now, what if they pay just say like one cent per call to that third party service? That means they could be paying say $10,000 uh, for this transaction, right? TBB could be paying. And so, I mean, obviously in the real world, maybe most things are not gonna be a million external calls like this, but even if it gets to dozens and dozens or hundreds, it, it, could, it could be pretty serious. All right, so, so how are we going to constrain this? Well, um, one option is we could run a timeout on our GraphQL, right? We could say like no real request that's legitimate, that's not out of hand, is going to take more than 100 milliseconds or 300 milliseconds. So we put some timeout, and then after the timeout, just abort the transaction. Another option is to say, well, I don't actually care about time going into using my backend database. I only care about the time going to this third-party server, right? So I'm not going to. I'm going to keep some kind of dynamic count, not of the users and orders that you're getting, but of those payment details. Every time you go for payment details, I'm going to increment my counter. And if you get over 500, that's just ridiculous. I'm going to abort the transaction. Another option is some kind of static analysis, right? I could look at the, the depth or width of the query to see how big it seems to be, or I can try to estimate what the actual cost will be of running this on my backend servers inside TBB, right? I can say how much CPU, how much memory is it gonna take, how much uh, money am I actually gonna have to spend for the third-party calls, some form of how expensive is this query for me to run in TBB, right? You could analyze that. Uh, the first three of these four are pretty simple to do, right? The fourth is extremely hard. So obviously I'd rather avoid 
my cost analysis if I can just do the early ones uh, and if it would be good enough. But the, the first couple really aren't uh, good enough. If you th think about it, right, it's, it's pretty dangerous to say, well, I mean, maybe it's malicious or maybe it's not malicious, but either way, bad transactions are coming in. If I spent 300 milliseconds on every one of them, that's that's too much of an attack vector, right? And if I do 500 requests wasting money on some to some credit card server that's external, um, you know, for every for every bad transaction, that's also that's just that's too much of an attack vector, and that's really not acceptable. So so again, we even though it's harder, we have to do the static analysis, um, and even within the static analysis, the first bullet, like I said, is easy. But just look at the top left of the screen. The depth is only four. It's not at all a ridiculous depth. The width is only one. That's not at all ridiculous, and it's already a, a clearly out of hand query. So, so the we we think it's worth doing static analysis because uh, it doesn't hurt to look at the depth and the width. But uh, and other you know we we've got a bunch of other other characteristics we look for static analysis. But it's really the cost is the one that's going to actually be necessary to properly do uh, this kind of work. All right, so let's look at an example here. Um, I, I think about an example of. TBB's main page, right? If you go to your own personal mobile banking, what's the what's the main uh, what's the main page that you look at? It's when you're looking at a given account and you look for every transaction in that account. You want to see the list down your web page on your mobile device, wherever it is, of every transaction, right? So let's say you know you might have 1,700 or you know more transactions, but for the purpose of the slide. Let's look at 17 transactions, All right? So there's 17 transactions, and let's say I'm on a small little mobile device that can fit five on a screen. So I want to show the most. Start with the most recent transactions. We always want to look at the most recent first. When you're looking at bank transactions, so I'm looking at 17 through 13, right? And then uh, if the user clicks next page or swipes through to the next page, then they should go to 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, right? And so they want to look page by page. We call slices of the data. Just show one slice of the pie at a time. Uh, how do we do this? Let's build up a GraphQL query. So we start by saying, you know, I'm going to fetch the, I want the account. I give it the account number, right? In this case, AV1035. Uh, and then for that account, I, well, I want to get back the name because in my little mobile app, I want to show the name of the account at the top of the page. And then I want to show the transactions, right? Um, the first thing I'm going to want to do is actually, besides the actual transactions, I want to know whether to have a next page, right? Should I have a next page button? Or not. If it's the last page, I don't want to give them a button to try to get the next page. So I'm going to ask, uh, it has next page. Is there is there still more data retrieved? If so, then you know I'll enable that button. If not, then not. And then I need the actual data itself. Right? So the actual edges, uh, I'm going to want to ask for the date and amount of every transaction so that I can show uh, those transactions for each of them, when it was, and how much it was for. All right, good so far. But what's the next problem? The next problem is I need some way to say that I only want a slice. I only want five of these transactions. All right? uh, in GraphQL, we call these slicing arguments. Uh, and again, after the, the, the uh, conference, you can get the slides. I've got a couple of links at the bottom where you can read about uh, either the relay spec or the GraphQL spec with, uh, with defining these kind of things. So there are some, some roughly standard ways. But for the core GraphQL spec, it doesn't actually matter what you name these. You can call it anything you want, but you want an argument it has some, some integer value that's going to tell you how many things you want in your list, how many things in your array, right? And, um, and they're typically called things like first and last, meaning I want the last transactions in, in my uh, ledger, right? So, uh, so now I'm going to add, right? I have the word transactions in the query. I add last five to say that I want only the last five of them. And the other thing I need to do is tell which last five, right? Because I'm going to start with the very last five. And after that, I want the last five before number 13, right? So how do I do that? I have a cursor that points to number 13 so that I can get the slice that's the last five before it. And that way, even if some other transactions are coming in the meantime while I was viewing the page, say 18, 19, and 20, I can still get the last five when I swipe on through that were before 13. All right, very nice. How do I get the cursor to pass? Well, I want to pass that cursor. I get it from the previous transaction, gave me the cursor for 13 when I got back 13, so I can pass it in. Very, very nice. Um, the last point on this slide I want to make is this last five argument, what does it mean? Because it does not actually mean that the transactions function is going to return five things. It only returns one thing. Uh, and the thing it returns has a field called page info, which only returns one thing, right? It's got an edges. There's only, there's only one edges function that's run once. But the edges function returns a list of five objects, right? So this five, as you see the blue box 
Um, the five is referring to everything within that blue box. There's going to be five cursors, uh, one for each transaction, five nodes, dates, and amounts. Uh, and as far as configuration to understand this, what I basically need is some record that tells me uh, before my static analysis. So for the type account, one of its fields is transactions, right? One of the that field has a number of arguments, and one of its arguments is last. And I need to know that that last argument sizes a list of uh, a slice, right? And which which list does it size? It sizes the field called the edges returns that list, and that's the one that sizes. So if I have this information in the box to the right, that tells me programmatically that this arrow is true, that the five refers to that blue box. And so then I can go ahead with my static analysis. And I think that seems kind of complicated, but I think that it would seem very, very simple if I just apply it to a concrete case, the exact same case. So we've got this. Uh, I just removed the cursor because I'm going for the first transaction. Um, and, but this is the same query at the left-hand side of the screen. So when I take the query, uh, let's go through line by line with the static analysis, and we're going to try to figure out which types and are, are returned how many times each and which fields, which like we already talked about, every field corresponds to a function. So which functions are called to resolve fields and how many times each? That's at the right-hand side of the screen. So I start with the top, the very top. Uh, I see that it's uh, I'm running query. So it's going to query type. The next line is account. I run the query.account function field right once. So it's got a count of one. And it returns an account type object, right? And so the account type. I increment that count to one. After that, you can see there's a name, but the name is just a string. And so the assumption here, by default, is that the um, is that like I probably got an account record back from my database, and it's got a few string fields on it. And so returning that string is actually trivial. It doesn't require any more database access. It doesn't require any like um, REST calls on the back end or anything like that. And so it's probably pretty much free. So I don't count that in my cost counts, and I'm not going to give it any cost. That's all configurable. So if you want to, you know, if that name is expensive for you, you can, you can configure it differently. But by default, we're going to skip the simple types like that. So we move on to transactions. And again, this is getting pretty formulaic at this point. Uh, the field account that transactions once returns the transaction connection once. Page in, uh, sorry, at this point, before I go into page info, uh, I, the transactions is where I attach this configuration, right? So at this point, I've got configuration that says, oh, you, you know, you over here, you've got an argument named last, and it sizes your field called edges. And so while I'm going through it, I see that last, in this case, is five in this query. So I'll keep down that five sizes the field edges, right? Keep that in your back pocket uh, and keep that for when you get to the edges field. Meanwhile, I get to page info. Page info is again just called once, returns one page info type. Now I get to edges. So now is when I have that extra information. Remember, I remembered that edges is going to return five. So the, the edges function is only called once. That's why the field count is transaction connection dot edges. I only put one. But even though it's only called once, it returns a list of five things, a JSON array of five objects. And so it's going to return five transaction edges. So in the type counts, notice that's my not just one transaction edges is five. Now within that, the the node, when I get to node, I'm only going to call it once for each transaction. But since I've got five transactions I'm calling it on, I might actually call this function up to five times, transaction edge dot node. And then it will return one transaction each, so five transactions. right? And, I, and I'm done. Everything else is just integers and strings. Uh, once I get the counts, the only thing that's left to do is to sum up the uh, weighted sum. Now, why is it a weighted sum? Because if you, if you think about it, some things might be much more expensive than others. We talked about. The uh, third-party calls that you know TVB gets charged money being more expensive. If you look at uh, maybe a transaction is much more expensive than a page info or whatever it is. So if I look at my resolver functions in my GraphQL middleware and I see which ones are actually expensive to run in CPU memory, whatever it is, then I can I can mark those as being more expensive. So the weighted sum will will weight those more strongly. In this case, let's just you know for the purpose of a demo, assume they're all weight one, and there's nothing complicated about it. Uh, and so, so weighted sum just becomes a sum. So just add up all the numbers, and you get the uh, the totals. In this case, uh, type cost of 14 and a field cost of 9. All right? So I think, like I said, as opposed to the previous screen, this one probably seems pretty straightforward just walking through. Uh, and with that, I would like to uh, to move to uh, to the demo. All right. All right, so uh, Olga, can you see this screen here? Yes, I can. All right, so uh, so here we've got 
uh, the, the management node, right? We're, we're saying that we want a new GraphQL proxy. I've already got the GraphQL backend server and I want to add a proxy for it. Uh, I can give it some name like bank demo. Right? I want to give it a URL to my backend server. Remember that with GraphQL, I've got a single uh, endpoint. So this is the one endpoint from which absolutely everything can be uh, introspected. I'm going to name my schema bank schema, just done. All right, uh, accept all of the bells and whistles it suggests by default. At this point, it's already introspected the back end. It knows everything about my server, and it's customized my API to that. And now I'm going to even click Activate API so that it gets activated all right at the beginning. And by the way, if you, uh, if you double click on the, the window with the demo, then you can see it larger. Hey, um, Marcus, one quick question that came in. Amgad Mohammed wants to know, I see that that has next page has no cost. I think it should always get more entities than specified to know if there's more or not, correct? So that has next page is a, um, uh, thanks for the question. The has next page is a Boolean that says whether there's next page. So by default, we said it doesn't have cost because just adding a Boolean of whether there's the next page, you know, just a Boolean by default, no cost. But um, but if you, you know, if that is actually costly, right? Because maybe it has to go to the backend server and figure out how many more things there are, something like that. You could you could change the cost for that. It's not actually retrieving the next page; it's just telling you whether there is one, so whether you should send another transaction. Thanks for the question. All right, so okay, so this is um, so now it, it, the this new API is already up. Right, I'm going to go click here just to copy the URL for it. Um, you know, if in a in a real situation, we'd have a whole bunch of uh, real production scenario. You would have, uh, you know, uh, go through the developer portal to subscribe and stuff. But I'm just going to use my default test thing here and put the GraphQL endpoint. Right. So if I reconnect, oh. I, Reconnect. There you go. So it's now it's fetched my introspection, and it knows it knows exactly uh exactly what I've got now. This is a third party tool I just went to. We've actually got Graphical, the one I showed you before, embedded into the product in three different places. But um, but this is a third party tool just on the open web to just kind of show that GraphQL is an open standard. So I don't need to be within my tool to use it. Uh, and I also well I I had the the um. It's me. I had uh, everything before this. The in um. Sorry, I was going to say I had I had everything uh, the the query in here, but I want to show you for GraphQL kind of how easy easy it is to build up this query, right? So the the you know I can use the the type ahead here to say what do I want to be querying for? Um, I want you know a query. I'm going to call it. I'm going to say I want the account. It'll help me with type ahead, say that ID is the field I should be passing it. I can ask for the particular name of the account, right? It tells you see the little X says that that's not good enough. Uh, so it tells me I need to give it something inside it. What can I put inside it, right? I can ask for the name of the account, something like that, right? It can help me pre print it. It can help me. I can just send it and get the response. So this is a good GraphQL query, and I get the response here, right? Besides the name, I, uh, what did we ask for before? We asked for the transactions. And I said I wanted the last five transactions. Right? Uh, and for each one, maybe I want, uh, sorry, the edges. Or what do I want each one? Let's say just the amount of money in the transaction. So if I send that, I get, you see, I get back five transactions, each one with the amount. Uh, and uh, I think before we also asked for a date. And then send that. I see also the dates are coming through. I can ask for just the last three instead of five. If my less room on my screen, I only get three back. Right, so everything's exactly what I want. Now for cost, I also have this endpoint. If I just say slash cost on the end, where instead of getting the data back, I can get the cost analysis back. Uh, this would help you build up. Like in our in our UI, we we use it uh, in the UI directly. But the 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 cost analysis, you see, some of them are just what I expected one account. One query, things like this. Some of them are not all I expected. Billions of, of things. That's because with just a GraphQL schema from introspection, I can already do a very good job of a lot of static analysis. But there's no way to constrain how big lists are going to be. 
So to do that, I have to go back here and edit my API, go back into the GraphQL schema tab, and actually give it, give it more information, which if I had gone here before, instead of just trying my API, I would have seen that there, here's the account type. Right, it tells me there's two warnings, and one of them is, in fact, on this one I'm using, transactions. Right, if I click on the warning, it says, if the gateway gets this, there's no way for it to know how many list items are being returned. So I suggest, that if it's true, that first and last both size your edges field, you should click here to apply that configuration. So it, you know, it helps me through this a lot. In this case, I'm going to click Apply All, apply all the suggestions. Normally, you would want to review those before doing it. But in this case, I want to move on with the demo. The, um, and you see here, so it's applied, for example, first and last as slicing arguments on transactions that they slice the edges field within not the transaction, but within transaction connection that's returned, it slices the edges field. All right, so with that, I go back to running, uh, running here, I run again, and the costs are all updated, right? Now they're not quite the 14 and nine that I had in the slide because I had changed this five to a three, but if I just put it right back and make it just like it was on the slide, then, uh, then what did I do different? Oh, this was also different than in the slides. I also had a page info. So let's put that back. Right, with this has next page Boolean. You see that Boolean there? Right, now I get back to my 14 and 9, just like on the slide. Right? Uh, which is nice to have those costs. And what's the next thing I might want to do? We talked about rate limiting. Let me not go to the cost endpoint, but the actual endpoint. And if I send this, say, a few times, I just keep getting the responses back. Right? But what if I want to rate limit it? Now, again, if real one, I would have uh, products and plans and rate limit on the like the gold plan, the silver plan, rate limit certain uh, certain users. But here, I'm just going to use the, on the sandbox catalog this auto auto product just to test it out and say instead of unlimited field cost, I want to limit it to 15 every three seconds. So if you think about it, right, I've got nine in one transaction, so that should get through, but two of them would be 18 would not get through. So I would expect not to be able to do two within the the three seconds of the first transaction. All right, so let's try that. If that went through by now at the publish, first one gets through. The second one gets a 429 back, saying that it's over its limit. If I send a bunch of these, right, I notice that it fails until it's been three seconds since last pass. And then it fails again, again, until three seconds since last pass. And then it'll pass, right? All right, so rate limit seems to work pretty good. Um, if I can. If something's what it, next, uh, I could also use the cost not just to to uh, to be equal for everything, but remember I said some things might be more expensive than others. So like I don't know. Here's uh, let's go on the let's say credit cards, right? So if I go into customer has a field credit card, right? I let's actually look what it is now. Like what if I start asking for a credit card? So every account has a joint owner. Joint owners have credit cards. And there, I might want to ask for the credit card number and the credit card pin. Yeah. So I can go ahead and ask for this, and I'll get data includes this credit card number. Right. I mean, this is not a problem. It's for the billing department. They should get the credit card. Uh, it's all fake data here. But don't try this credit card at home. The um, but the uh. But let's say you know maybe it's more expensive because I have to actually retrieve it from a third-party server. And I can just go here and increase the cost and say I'd like you to you know, or I can type in whatever cost I want here. Say it's eleven. So if it's eleven cost to get a credit card, uh, I mean in this particular case because I've made fifteen be the limit, that's going to even reject one, right? Because one transaction, 15, eleven plus nine, is already going to be over my limit. So even the first transaction, I'll get a four twenty-nine. But if I had a higher limit, right, I'd still be able to get them through, but just not as many. But what if this is an API not for the billing department, but for the order analytics? And credit cards, like we said before, just not appropriate at all. Then I can click here to fully remove the credit card field. Or instead, I could just go to the, let's say, the credit card type entirely. And I could say remove the entire credit card type, which removes the field as well, because you can't have a field return credit card if you don't have a type credit card. right? And so what happens if I entirely remove credit card? That's then obviously at that point it's not just a 429, it's a 500. It doesn't exist at all, but it's going to be even more than that. So let's look over here in the right hand pane. You see the automatic up to date documentation that was retrieved from the server, and here's the customer inside. They have a credit card with this documentation, credit card on file to charge for any purchases. Uh, so between address and accounts, I have credit card. Now that I've removed it, if I reconnect, you see I disconnected, so it didn't happen automatically. Otherwise, it would be automatic. But um, at my GraphQL endpoint, I'm going to reconnect. 
So it'll just automatically refetch, right? And so it refetches here, and there's no more credit card between address and accounts. It went away. It's not documented. What else happened over here? Since I'm using a credit card, it flags it as invalid with local validation. You see this little X says cannot query field credit card on site customer. So the same thing if I had some name that had never been there before, just foo, it's the exact same error. And if I decide, well, I'm smart, I know it's there even though the, the management layer is pretending it's not, and I send the actual request, I get a 500 back. And if you look inside the 500, the payload is the actual validation error, which as if it had been you know, foo or XXX, some, you know, some field that doesn't exist at all. So basically, there's absolutely no information leakage. The schema doesn't have it. The documentation doesn't have it. The um, local validation doesn't allow it. The actual sending of the transaction doesn't work as if it was never there in the first place. It's really been removed. So these are some examples of, uh, right, of, of going, uh, going back. So now let me just conclude. I want to ask the question, TVB's learned a lot about GraphQL. So, uh, so now that they learned all this stuff about GraphQL, their question, oops, their question is, should they use GraphQL, right? Um, and for this question of should TBB use GraphQL, basically they should consider the trade-offs. REST, uh, about 20 years old. 20 years ago, Roy Fielding came out with his PhD dissertation on REST, and he mentioned known trade-offs. He mentioned explicitly in his dissertation that you have many advantages, but one of the disadvantages was not being able to optimize for the client. Right, so if this is your problem that TBB is having, that's a known trade-off. The rest, that rest has a disadvantage. GraphQL was also designed with known trade-offs. The people who designed GraphQL intentionally were trying to optimize things for the client experience uh, more than for the server experience. There are different different advantages in both ways. You have to consider what the trade-offs are. Are they relevant for your case? Um, usually, that means TBB would be considering: Do they have more internal or external endpoints? Do they have many clients or few clients? Are they fast evolving their APIs, or are they planning to leave them for five years without changing them? Uh, and the main point of this talk is that if you put proper management in front of your GraphQL server, it dramatically changes the landscape of these trade-offs. So you know, with where you can do management with, the better the management is for rate limiting, modernization, threat protection, uh, all, all the you know, not leaking information, all these kind of things, lets you manage your GraphQL APIs, you can potentially change when would be a good uh, time to, to trade off and use GraphQL. But points are all still relevant. All right, so that is the end of the talk. We are just about at the end of the time. If anybody has a, a question, you can take a question. And for after the after uh, the conference, you get the slides. I do have uh, some links if you want to look more into what's good and bad about GraphQL. One question did come in, Morris, which is um, Sid just asked, would it be possible to use GraphQL and REST both for coming commingling data? All right, thanks, Sid. Um, so yes, I mean, I think you, like, if you think of kind of REST as being, you know, if you have a backend database and then you put a REST front end where you're, you're querying through the data, you could have put a GraphQL front end that's querying through the data, you could certainly use both of them for the same backend data. Um, you can also imagine having an API that has like a RESTful call to to log in, and uh, and then GraphQL to query data, which has to pass some token you got back from the login or something like that. Uh, so there, there are different ways you could combine them. Um, you but you can also use GraphQL. Like I gave a picture at the beginning, uh, near the beginning, where GraphQL was a server in front of the. Um, in front of your backends, and there was databases and REST endpoints and different things in the backend. So that's another way you can commingle: is you could have a single graph, and that GraphQL can be providing a uh, a single graph view on top of many backend data sources. So that's one of the things that some people you know, GraphQL is still getting used in, in novel ways all the time. But a bunch of companies are using it to be like a, a graph in front of different disparate data sources. So I don't know. Did that answer your question? Yep. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Sid. Awesome. And uh, any other questions? I don't see any more questions come through. Thank right. you so much, Morris, for um, for doing the workshop and presenting it. Um, as Morris mentioned, we'll make the slides available after the session. Uh, and if you have any questions, we're both online. So please go ahead and ping us. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you. Any questions? Uh, just follow up with me later. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Roger.